Theology 2. In this section, we will deal with the attributes of God. And, well, <laughs> hopefully the nature and names of God in the last half. Attributes are the quality or characteristics of a person or things. Now, general revelation gives us a glimpse of God's attributes. But until we come to God's word, we understand the character of God as he's revealed it to us through special revelation. Uh, firstly, God's natural attributes are defined. They define the very nature of God's being. They're unique to him, not characteristics of man, neither now or in the future. This is sometimes questioned because 1 John 3, 2 says, But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In what sense shall we be like him? We will be like Jesus in his moral attributes, love, holiness, mercy, and so on. But we can never become him in his natural abilities, such as eternity, omniscience, omnipotence, etc., He's described as transcendent in Isaiah 57, 15, the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, in his eminence in Isaiah 57 and 15 and Colossians 1 through 7. Although God is above all transcendent, he's seen fit to be involved within his creation, eminence. The climax of his eminence was coming as a baby and living for 33 years on earth and dying on a cross for man's sin. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Isaiah 57, 15. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Ephesians 4, 6. In eternity, God has no beginning or ending. There is no past, present, or future with God only eternal presence and is not limited by time. Psalm 92, before the mountains were brought forth, or even you has formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. His infinity, he has no limitation in space. All of his attributes are without limit. 1 Kings 8, 27, Psalm 103, 17, Psalm 139, 7 and 12, Psalm 147, 5, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Jeremiah 23, 24. His immutability. He's not susceptible to change, nor is he capable. He is unchangeable, immutable, invariable, and permanent. Psalm 22, 24, 27, and Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, James 1, 17, Matthew, Malachi 3, 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Some have suggested that God does indeed change because of verses like Genesis 6, 6. It repented the Lord that he had made man. Or 1 Samuel 15, 11, 35. It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king. These verses seem to contra contradict Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. God's character never changes. Though he may change or repent of his plan of working with individuals or nations, he consistently deals with individuals and nations on the basis of their response to him. When man's response changes, then God changes his plan of working with that person or nation. God's unchanging holiness requires him to treat the wicked differently than the righteous. When the righteous become wicked, his treatment of them must change. The sun is not fickle nor partial because it melts the wax but hardens the clay. The change is not in the sun but in the object it shines upon. The change in God's treatment of men is described anthropomorphically, giving God human characteristics, as if it were a change in God himself. But it is only a change in his plan. Threats not fulfilled, as in Jonah 3, 4, and 10, are explained by their conditional nature. God's love will adapt itself to every varying mood and condition of his children so as to guide their steps, sympathize with their sorrows, and answer their prayers. God responds to us more quickly than the mother's face to the changing moods of her babe. 
This is adapted from Augustus Strong's Systematic Theology, page 124. Next, his omniscience, Psalm 139, 2, Isaiah 40, 26, 46, and 10, Romans 11, 23. Omniscience means God is all-knowing. He knows the future as well as the past. He knows all things, whether actual or merely possible. He knows things immediately and spontaneously. He knows the thoughts of man better than man knows them himself, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46.10 Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Psalm 147.5 Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. You compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, you know it altogether. Psalm 139, 1-4 Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Romans 11, 33 and 4, 34. God's knowledge is beyond our comprehension. It's not that he knows more than we do, he knows differently than we do. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God's knowledge of the future should not be confused with God's determination of the future. He can know a certain event will happen without forcing it to happen that way. Sometimes God determines an, an event ahead of time. Sometimes God merely knows an event ahead of time. Jeremiah 1, 5, Acts 2, 23, 15, 18, Romans 8, 29, and 1 Peter 1, 2. God's omniscience is his free act of his will. He can temporarily suppress knowledge if he so wills. As the Christ, he could increase in wisdom, Luke 2, 52, Ask questions, Luke 2.46, and empathize with the learner, Hebrews 2.17. He could will not to know the day or the hour of his second coming, Mark 13.26.32. If he desires, he can determine not to remember our sins. This wonderful ability is a reminder of the power of the blood of Christ to completely cleanse us from our sins. I, even I am he that blots out your transgression for my own sake and will not remember your sins, Isaiah 43, 25. For I will be merciful to the unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more, Hebrews 8, 12. God knows all about you. He made you exactly the way you are. He's giving you the abilities and talents you need to do the job you need to do. He's not giving you more abilities than you can use, nor has he shortchanged you by not giving you the abilities that you would need to have. Those who fear doing God's will often never consider that an omniscient God knows what is best for them both now and in the future. We can see only today while God sees what is best for us 50 years in the future. It makes sense to trust him with our daily walk as well as our eternal destiny. Omnipresence means that God is everywhere present in the universe in the whole of his being. It's incorrect to suggest that God could be divided up in some material way, and only a part of him is present in each part of the universe. He fills every part of space with his entire being. Psalm 139, 710, Whither shall I go from my spirit, or whither shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 4. Am I a God at hand, says God the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in his secret places that I shall not see them? Said him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? He's, God is present in the whole universe but by free act of his own will. We reject the pantheistic notion that God is limited to his creation. 
He is the creator of space and therefore not subject to it. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house I've built. 1 Kings 8, 27. Omnipresence does not mean, however, that he is equally present and present in the same sense in all his creatures. The nature of his indwelling is in harmony with that of his creatures. He does not dwell on earth as he does in heaven, in animals as he does in man, in the inorganic as he does in the organic creation, in the wicked as he does in the pious, the believer nor in the church as he does in Christ. There is an endless variety in the manner in which he is eminent in his creatures and in the measure in which they reveal God to those who have eyes to see. Lewis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, page 61. Unregenerated man has tried to remove God from his life throughout the ages, and yet there exists within each man a God-shaped void that can only be satisfied with an omnipresent God. The fool says in his heart, no, God's not for me. Someday God will grant that and save the tragic request as God's omnipresent power is withdrawn from the lake of fire. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. Now let's look at omnipotence. He is all-powerful and able to do whatever he wills to do. By his great power, he created the universe's creatures. He maintains existence in all that he's created and determines the events and the final end of the universe and its inhabitants. In scriptures, he's called Almighty God, Genesis 17.1, and the Lord God Almighty in Revelation 4.18. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know you can do anything, Job 42.1. O oh Lord God, behold, you have made the earth, heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out thy arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah 32, 7. But Jesus beheld them and said to, unto them, With men this is impossible. With God all things are possible. Matthew nineteen twenty six, For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Revelation nineteen six. God's omnipotent hand holds the universe together. Everything in existence is maintained by his power. And all that's necessary for the universe to be destroyed is for God to withdraw his preserving power. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Colossians 1, 16-7. God can do anything in harmony with his nature. He is not uh, foolish or self-contradictory, sinful, unworthy of deity, or against the promises he has given in his word. He cannot lie. Titus 1.2 He limits his omnipotence by his word and his will. And he also limits himself by giving to each man a free will to choose to accept his offer of salvation or to reject it. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. First John 5, 11 and 14. This is a great comfort to Christians. No problems too big for God, no trials too difficult, no challenges impossible. The, throughout the Bible, the Christian is encouraged to make his problems known to the Lord and trust him to meet every need. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27, 1. Quote, the scriptural affirmations of God's omnipotence are not made in the form of definition, which is foreign to the method of scriptures. It often appears in the form of recognition of his universal sovereignty and appeal to his sufficient power. But the most deep and spiritual affirmation of this great reality is wholly informal and without apparent intention to emphasize the doctrine. It lies in the broad fact that God is proclaimed throughout the scriptures as the one whose power can be safely trusted by all souls with all their needs and destinies, both now and forever. The Christian thought of God is that of a God who is able to do all rational, right, and worthy things, a God equal to all emergencies and competent to the care of that which he has made. William Newton Clark. God's moral attributes. First of all, the definition of a moral attribute. These are characteristics of God revealed in his interaction with man, mankind, his love, his grace, his mercy, justice, holiness, righteousness, truth, and goodness. 
These attributes of God are example of what should be in every man. Although we cannot be like God, uh, never. In his natural attributes, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, we should strive to be like him in his moral attributes. Someday when we receive our glorified bodies, we will be truly like him in his moral attributes. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, 1 John 3, 2. Let's look at, at this, in this part, a description of God's moral attributes. His holiness is the perfection of God where he abhors that which is evil and he demands purity. God is separated totally from sin and evil, James 1.13. Because of his holiness, a sinful individual has no right to come into his presence. This is the reason God turned his back on his son on Calvary when he became sin for us who knew no sin. If we approach God, we must come through the merits or holiness of another, and that way is made for us through Jesus Christ. He who was no sin took our sin. Exodus fifteen eleven, Psalm twenty two one through three, Matthew twenty seven forty six, and Revelation fifteen fourteen, Romans five one and two. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We approach God with reverence and godly fear. He's not merely the man of stairs or the daddy in the sky. God is holy. We should not use the lingo of the world to praise the Lord or refer to God. In other words, profane language. We should come to him with reverential awe. He, God deserves more than our contemporary expressions to to describe the one who is above all. And then we are commanded to be holy. First Peter 1 Peter 1.15, 16 says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be you all holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. We need to look upon sin as exceedingly sinful. And we need to picture each of our sins as being put upon Jesus Christ as he died on the cross for this, our sins. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Be you holy, for I am holy. First Peter 1 Peter 1.16 God has justice. It's one of his moral attributes. He carries out the laws that he has imposed. It has two sides, remunerative, rewarding, and retributive, chastising. Since God cannot act contrary to his law, sin must be punished. A person must suffer for his own sin or else accept God's plan of redemption by which Jesus Christ becomes the sinner's substitute. God is the one who has been wronged by sin. Therefore, he's the only one who can determine how the restitution has been, is to be made. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 a. We must always strive to be just in our dealings with others. There should be balance in our lives. Even God has a perfect balance between love and justice. The next moral attribute is righteousness. It is the attribute that causes God to do what is always right. Adam realized that sin deserved God's justice, but he also realized that God does not punish the righteous. Abraham, therefore, pleaded for Sodom on the basis of God's righteousness. That be far from you to do after this matter, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of the all, whole earth do right genesis eighteen twenty five. this wonderful attribute guarantees that he will always keep his promises he can do another his attribute of righteousness is the reason that men can approach a holy god note these verses nehemiah 9 7 through 8 you are the lord the god who made a covenant with him abraham to give the land i say to his seed and has performed your words for you are righteous Second Timothy 4 8. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I beseech you, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem. Daniel 9 16. Second Timothy 4 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, thy righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but into a home, all of them also that love his appearing. God rewards the righteous and the Christian. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James 5, 16. 
the philosophy of this world is, is hedonistic. If it feels right, do it. But God's word demands that we do right because it is right. A Christian ought to have godly character, and godly character is doing what is right regardless of convenience, the circumstance, or the eventual outcome. Joseph had character in rejecting the offers of Potiphar's wife in spite of the results. And each Christian has these same ob obligations. Let's look at love. Love is the attribute which moves God to communicate his concern for the ultimate welfare of the ones he loves. His love moved him to sacrifice his life for the sake of another. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay his life down for his friends. John 15, 13. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16. He that spared not his own son, but delivered it up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all good thing? Romans 8, 32. Now the world uses love in a flippant way. And many Christians have a shallow biblical view of love. Love is concerned for the welfare of another, even above one's own welfare. The world's idea of love is usually lust. Love is giving, lust is getting. Lust can't wait to get, while love can't wait to give. As Christians, we are commanded to love other Christians, 1 John 4, 20 and 21, to love our enemies, Matthew 5, 43 and 44, and to love the Lord, Deuteronomy 6, 5. We are to show our love for God by keeping his commandments, John 14, 15. Let's look at mercy. It's God's compassion for the sinner, Romans 5, 8, and not giving him what he deserves. Who is like, who is God like unto you that pardons iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy, Micah 7, 18. Mercy is, comes from the same root as the word for a mother's womb. It is the caring for that which is completely helpless. He has shown the old man what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6, 8. So look at grace. It's the unmerited goodness and love of God for those who have forfeited it. Ephesians 1, 6, and 7, 2, 7, and 9. Titus 2, 11. And Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Grace is God not giving us what we deserve. Goodness, God's goodness is his revealed in his bountiful dealing with mankind. Psalm 145, 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Matthew 5, 45. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And truth, God cannot lie nor tolerate untruth. God could commend Rahab's faith, Hebrews 11.31, James 2.25, but could not commend her lie, Joshua 2.4. God is not a man that he should lie, Numbers 23.19. There hath not failed one word of all his good promises, 1 Kings 8.56. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14.6. Sanctify them through truth, thy word is truth, John 17.17. 17.